Over the past few decades, tremendous advancements have been made in the field of neuroscience, from mapping the human brain to creating devices that can capture digital images of our thoughts. But what if we could upload a digital copy of our memories and consciousness to a point that human beings could actually achieve a sort of digital immortality? This idea has inspired many science fiction movies, including the upcoming film Transcendence, where one man's mind is uploaded into a supercomputer which possesses the collective knowledge of all of humanity. But while the film is fiction, the concept behind it is very real. It's also the subject of a new book called Future of the Mind, which is currently number one on the New York Times bestseller list. The author is renowned theoretical physicist Michio Kaku. Earlier today, Breaking the Set producer Manuel Rapolo caught up with Dr. Kaku and first asked him how far we really are from achieving a digital upload of consciousness. Just last year, for the first time in world history, a memory was recorded. We can actually tape record a memory and insert it back into an animal and it remembers. This is amazing. At Wake Forest University, also in Los Angeles, they took a mouse, trained the mouse to sip water, recorded the memory in the hippocampus right here, small organ that processes memory. The mouse later forgot that. Then they shot the memory back into the mouse and bingo, the mouse got it the first try. Next will be primates. Perhaps a monkey eating a banana will record that memory and insert it back in. And the short-term goal is to create a brain pacemaker for Alzheimer's patients. In the future, we're going to have millions of people who forget where they live, wander around. Why not have a button? You push the button, and you immediately remember where you live, who you are, who your kids are. And beyond that, who knows? Maybe we'll upload the vacation that you never had. <laughs> It just, it, it seems so mind-blowing to me to, to consider that, that memory, which is not a static thing, it's always changing, it's evolving depending on our, on our experiences, can be digitized. It just, it's, it's, it's really mind-blowing. But uh, I want to ask you about something else that you mentioned in the book, um, the ability for telepathy. And you've actually said in the past that in the future, humans will be able to mentally contact anybody we want, see whatever image we want, and do, and if we don't like it, we can just turn it off. That's really? right. In the future, in fact, today we can get uh, so that you walk into a room, we'll put on a headset, such that you can control the lights, turn on the TV, call for your car, tell your car where to go, type, dictate documents without ever touching a computer screen. And our children will wonder, how could you possibly live in a world where you had to touch the screen and you had a mouse and you had to type? Everybody just thinks and types, makes documents, controls cars. It's, it's fascinating where we're headed, and it, and it seems like it really is inevitable. And I think a lot is taken for granted over the things that we're already able to do now. I mean, you were just referring to, to these sensors in the brain that can capture images inside the brain. What are, what are some of the other practical applications that these things could have? Well, this will replace the internet. It'll become a brain net. <clears throat> we'll record emotions, thoughts, patterns of behavior and send it on the internet. Teenagers will love it. Can you imagine Facebook? You send emotions, your first date, your first kiss, your first senior prom, all on the internet. Teenagers already put little like happy faces on their, on their emails, right? We're going to be able to record thoughts, and the movies are going to be replaced by the brain net. Movies today are a flat screen with sound. That's the movies, right? In the future, perhaps emotions and feelings will also be conveyed. This is called total immersion entertainment. That's, it's amazing. And, and, and actually, that reminds me of this, this new movie that's uh, coming out now, this Johnny Depp movie called Transcendence, where it kind of takes that premise as well, of, you know, uh, taking your consciousness and, and uploading it uh, digitally. Um, but I wanted to ask you, I mean, you make it sound like it's going to be a lot of fun, but it also, there's, there's aspects that I think are a little bit terrifying. And I wanted to ask you about mm -hmm. this, this new pill that's being developed that can slow down a person's perception of, of time. And what's being said is that, you know, this could be applied to prisoners. Uh, and given, they'll take a pill, it'll, it'll slow down uh, the perception of time so that eight, eight uh, hours could feel like a thousand years, a thousand years sentence. How would this work and why does the future sounds so terrifying. <laughs> well, we are tinkering with the brain itself. For example, people who have traumatic memories of war, sometimes they're paralyzed with these horrible memories of a rape, an accident, warfare. We can create a forgetful drug. 
that actually takes the edge of many of our most uh, violent and, and oppressive memories. However, the President's Commission on Bioethics recommended against marketing the forgetful drug because they said that even unpleasant memories are useful. We learn from them. But personally, I think that sometimes some memories are so disastrously awful that they paralyze you. They prevent you from becoming a normal person. And I think we should allow forgetful drugs to be marketed. Also, drugs and therapies which can perhaps even increase intelligence are now being talked about. We'll have perhaps memories that we can upload into the mind, perhaps memories of a job that we're not trained for. And, or perhaps a college student will upload a course that they flunked in college. We can perhaps increase our intelligence. And now we're also investigating super intelligence, photographic memory. People who memorize everything. They hear a concert, they see a landscape, they can draw the landscape, they can re reproduce the entire concert on one try. How is it possible that people have that in mind? We now believe that the mind records, but the mind also forgets deliberately. These people, the forget mechanism is broken. They never forget. They have a photographic memory, and we think that some great scientists of the past had this ability, the ability to have access to powers of the mind that we cannot as mortals. Right, and it, it, and this is nothing new. This is this is something that that you know can date back for, for for a very long time. People that have those photographic memories, and you've actually said that right now, the time that we're living in is the golden age for for learning about the mind. That we've learned more in the last 15 years than in all of prior human history. Why? What took so long? Because only recently have we had the physics, the instruments like the MRI scans that are sensitive enough to see the blood flow of the thinking brain down to like a tenth of a millimeter. And now we have supercomputers that can actually read these thoughts and control computers by thinking. So by thinking, we can now control mechanical arms, mechanical legs, we can type, uh, we can control thermostats, turn on the web, turn on, change a channel on a TV set, turn on the toaster, all of it just mentally. And at the next international soccer games in Brazil, scientists at Duke University want to take someone who's totally paralyzed, outfit him with an exoskeleton, and he will introduce the international soccer games in Brazil. That's amazing. Um, and actually, one of those things that I've always enjoyed about your work is you're, you're very gifted in, in taking these complex theories and making them easier easier to understand. Um, I wanted to ask you about this recent discovery about the gravitational waves that are mm -hmm. essentially remnants of the Big Bang. Can you explain why this is such an amazing discovery? Well, we think that at the instant of the Big Bang, gravity waves, waves that we've never seen before, dominated the Big Bang. And now we see them with our, with our detectors in the South Pole. Einstein predicted this 98 years ago. And it took 98 years for us to see that at the instant of creation, there were, in fact, gravity waves. Now, this is very incredible because it means that the Big Bang was a quantum event, meaning that there's a probability it could happen again and again and again, creating a multiverse of parallel universes. So our universe may not be the only universe. This result has philosophical, theological implications. If the Big Bang happened once, as a quantum event, it can happen again. It's, it's, it's a subject that's so almost impossible for the human mind, <laughs> at least mind, to even fathom. Uh, but you bring up a, a good point, which is another subject that, that's very interesting that you discuss is God. You, you, um, you describe yourself as a pantheist, and I was hoping that for our viewers that don't know what pantheism means, you could explain that and how that ties into your work in theoretical physics. Well, Einstein was asked a question about God, and he says there are really two kinds of God. First is the personal God, the God that answers your prayers, that smites your enemies in the Philistines. But he didn't believe in that God. He believed in the God of Spinoza, the God of harmony, beauty, simplicity. You know, the universe could have been ugly. It could have been random. It could have been chaotic. And yet, here we are in an orderly universe that obeys very simple laws. You can put all the laws of physics on one sheet of paper. That's simplicity and elegance. And that's the God of Einstein, the God of Spinoza, the God of harmony. And that's the God that I lean toward. That is, the universe itself is so gorgeous, and it didn't have to be that way. I think that's something we could all get behind. Um, I wanna, I'd love to continue to talk about um, 
God and the universe and everything. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about something a little bit more earthly, something a little bit closer to home that you've been outspoken about as well, which is Fukushima and the nuclear crisis in Japan. Um, there's so much disinformation out there. How, what is the severity of the crisis right now as you see it? The crisis is much more severe than we're led to believe. Documents have been coming out over the last two years showing how the utility and the government deliberately suppressed vital information. Did you know that even as the accident was progressing and they said, don't worry, everything's under control, they were contemplating evacuating Tokyo. Evacuating Tokyo. I mean, it's mind-boggling, but that's how severe the accident was. Now, right now, we have three melted reactors. It'll take 40 years, by their estimate, to clean up this disastrous accident, and it could start again anytime soon. A small earthquake could tip it over, and the accident starts all over again. I mean, that's, it, it really is it, in, insanity, <laughs> nuclear, nuclear insanity, really. Like I said before, though, like, and, and as you mentioned, you know, that sounds like a conservative estimate, 40 years uh, for the cleanup. There's so many conflicting reports that are coming out. The seafood safe to eat, oh, no, it's not. The radiation's going to hit the West Coast, and other scientists will disagree. What will be the, the long-term impacts? Is this an ever, everlasting crisis? It's not an everlasting crisis, but there are dead zones. Dead zones are on the reactor. That'll be dead zones for decades to come. And all of us have a piece of Fukushima in you. I can take a Ganga counter right to your body and detect some of the radiation from the reactor. However, it's minimal. So don't think that everything is going to be radioactive here in the United States. It's not that way. Food you can eat. However, we have to monitor the food very carefully because we do know that radioactive cesium with a half-life of about 30 years leaked into the ocean and it's water soluble and it did get into the fish and sea life around Fukushima. But the government does monitor these things and so far as we know the food supply is safe. Well, I mean, it, it, I hope so. <laughs> I hope that we, can, that we can eat this food. And um, I did want to ask you, you know, given that the crisis, uh, like you said, another minor earthquake could, could trigger another meltdown. Another tipping point. Exactly. Right. And, and this, there's so many different reactors all over the world. There's so many here in the United States. Do you think that as a result of Fukushima, you know, what we've learned from Chernobyl, that in the future will eventually do away with nuclear energy? Do you see us moving beyond that? Well, Germany has already thrown in the towel. Germany says N never again. They saw what happened at Fukushima. A disaster in Germany could literally wipe out Germany as, as a nation. And so they're phasing out nuclear entirely. Switzerland follows suit. Italy is sort of teetering right now. And even Japan is teetering on the, on the brink. They have a national debate as to whether or not to go nuclear or not. See, after World War II, Japan made the Faustian bargain. Faust was the legendary figure who sold his soul to the devil for unlimited power. That's the Faustian bargain, bargain that Japan made after the war. And now they're going to have to reanalyze whether it's worth it to sell your soul to the devil. Well, that's the future of nuclear energy, I suppose. Dr. Michio Kaku, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Theoretical physicist, author of The Future of the Mind. It's number one uh, right now. Everybody check it out. Thank you so much. Thank you.